Hi, I'm Tommy Master from data36.com and this is the next episode of my SQL tutorial series and in this one I will show you how you can create new SQL tables in your data science projects. And when working with data, even if you are not a data engineer, you will have to create SQL tables all the time. Maybe you want to store the output of your SQL queries in new tables, Maybe you need to pull new data sources like CSV files into your projects. Maybe you want to store your transformed and clean data in another SQL table without deleting your original data sets. There are many more examples, but the point is sooner or later, you will have to learn how to create new tables in SQL. In this video, I will show you that. I will show you the create table SQL statement the syntax and the different column parameters that you have to set. And in another video, I will also show you how to load data in your freshly created SQL tables. But before we get started, two quick comments. First, if this is your first time here, this video is a part of an SQL tutorial series, so maybe you want to check out the other videos too. If so, find the link for the full tutorial series in the description. And secondly, there is an article version of this video where you will find the full code base that I will use in this video. If you need that, you will find a link for that in the description as well. Okay, it's time to get started. Before we dig deeper into how to create new tables, we have to talk about a conceptual element of SQL, the different data types. Let's see what sorts of data we can put into an SQL table. And just a quick note, in the current version of PostgreSQL, there are more than 40 different data types. And here I will introduce only seven, the seven most important ones, well, at least in my opinion. And the first one is integer, which is basically a whole number without a fractional part. So like one, 156 and so on. It can be a decimal, so a number with fractional part, like 3.14159264, or anything else. Boolean, that's a binary value. Traditionally, it can be either true or false. Date, which speaks for itself, and you can also choose the format you like. Usually, I use this format. Time, it's the time and you can decide the format of this as well, like this one. Or you can do timestamp, the date and the time together, something like this. And of course, your data type can be text, and this is the most general data type, but it can be alphabetical letters only, or a mix of letters and numbers and any other characters. So for instance, hello, Tommy, or R2D2, or an IP address, and so on. And why is this so important? It's important because when you create a new SQL table, you have to define which data type you will have in each column. And once it's defined, you have to stick with it. For instance, if you set a new column with an integer data type, you won't be able to include text or dates or anything else in it. This means that you should be conscious about data types and also design your data tables and your database before you actually create them. Okay, after all this, let's see the create table statement. And let me copy paste here a small draft that can help you. And with create table SQL statements like this one, you can create new SQL tables. Of course, this won't work. As I said, this is just a draft, but soon we will get there. The point is that Create table is the SQL keyword. You should always have this at the beginning of your SQL statement when you create a new table. Next, the new table name will be the name of your freshly created table. It can be whatever you prefer. So it was zoo before. That table is already created for us, but zoo or another zoo table, it's possible. I mean, I recommend coming up with a simple and meaningful name. This is not one that reflects to the data you will have in here. For instance, if we will have students here, it could be the students data table. 
And the quick thing, I also suggest using lowercase characters. It doesn't really matter though, our current PostgreSQL setup is not case sensitive for table names, but I think it's nicer and more transparent that way. The first column, second column, third column, and so on. These will be the names of the new columns in the table, and the same applies to them as to the new table name. You should use simple and meaningful names, preferably in lowercase. And here comes the tricky part, or at least the unusual part for beginners in SQL. For every column, you have to specify the data type, just as we discussed. As you see, after the first column, there is a first column data type. This could be, this cannot be first column data type, this has to be one of the seven things, or actually one of the 40 plus things that you have in SQL, but one of the data types that we discussed. For instance, text. But if you want it to fill it with numbers and perform mathematical calculations on them in the future, you should choose numeric data types like integer or decimal. Or if you want it to use date time functions and date in a given column, for instance, in the third column, you should add date or time or timestamp and so on. Okay, so this is the concept and all these will become much clearer through an example. And let's create a new table in SQL using SQL Workbench. Oh, and by the way, I assume that you have already gone through either the article or the video version of the installation process where I showed you how to install your own data server, how to install SQL Workbench to your computer and so on and so on. And if you haven't done those yet, I added a link to the description and I recommend that you check those out. But if you have already have this, then go ahead and log into SQL Workbench and do the coding with me. You can use any SQL manager tools you prefer. My favorite is, at least from the free ones, is SQL Workbench. So I will use that in this tutorial. And let's create a new table. I will remove this, but I will follow this format as I create my new table. Only I will replace these dummy placeholders with real values and with real column and table names. And I will create a table for storing the imaginary chemistry test results of an imaginary class. Okay, let's do this. Again, create table. That's the actual command or statement that will create the table. Let's define the table name, which will be test results for me and between parentheses let's define six columns the first one is name that will contain the name of the students it's a text data format of course there will be a student id that's going to be an integer integer for me then a birth date for each student which of course will be date, whoops, and test results. Oh, sorry, it's test result actually. So it's one test result for each student. It's a decimal value grade. It's going to be text. And whether the student passed the test or not, this is a Boolean value. Cool. And of course, the semicolon at the end. Let's run it. And it says that the table test results is successfully created. So again, in this table, I created six columns with five different data types, text, date, decimal, Boolean, and integer. And if I query this table, I can actually query this table, select everything from test results. Of course, I will get an empty table, but at least I can see the column headers. So I know that my table has been created. Great. But we are not done yet. Because when you create a new table, from an SQL manager tool like SQL Workbench, sometimes you have to 
quote unquote, publish the changes you made in the tool to your data server. In programming, this is often referred as committing your changes. And when I say publishing, don't worry about it. In this case, publishing means that you make your changes visible only for other users on your server. And of course, it does not mean that it will be available for everyone on the internet. So practically, if you are the only one who uses this server, only you will see this data. And committing only means that you will basically synchronize what's happening in your SQL Manager tool to your server. And I said sometimes, and not always, so you only have to sometimes comment this, because in most SQL Manager tools, there is an auto commit function too. You can actually check whether yours is on or off. And in SQL Workbench, I will just show this and I won't turn on auto commit for myself. But in SQL Workbench, you can set this before you connect to the data server. So if I open this connection window, actually, mm -hmm, there is the auto commit button. If I take this, and if I next time connect it to the data server this way, then my changes would be automatically committed to the data server. But as I said, I won't take this for myself and I will click cancel because I actually want to show you how you can commit things. In SQL Workbench, it's not too hard. It's only that you type commit and you execute your statement and it says that commit is executed successfully and with that your table is not just created but this change the new table creation also happened on your data server now just a quick comment here why is this important it's important because if your changes are not committed they will be lost after you close your connection in your sql manager tool that means that next time you open it and log into your data server, for instance, in SQL Workbench, if you do not commit, everything you have created will be gone. And I've made this mistake a few times before, and believe me, it's very unpleasant. And I see the aspiring and junior data scientists in my online courses doing these mistakes all the time. Point is, watch out for committing. Okay, let me talk about the syntax, because it's important. You know, in SQL, syntax is important. And again, I see people new to SQL having a hard time with the syntax of the create table statement. So let me give you a quick recap about how to do it right. The first thing to watch out for is that after the create table and table name part of your statement, the column information actually goes between parentheses. The other thing is that the different columns have to be separated with commas. And I personally recommend using line breaks between columns and tabs between the column names and the data types. Remember, indentations and line breaks do not affect the execution of the SQL statement, only make it easier to read. And of course, don't forget the semicolon from the end of the SQL statement. If you want to hear more SQL syntax best practices, I created a dedicated video about that as well, and you can check it out. I added that to the description. And let's move on and see how can we delete tables in SQL. And deleting a table is even simpler than creating one. It's, I won't need this one. So it's this drop table, and you will have to add the table name. In this example, if I wanted to delete the test results data table, I could type drop table test results. And this will remove the whole table with all the data in it. If you have data in your tables, in this case, we don't. Anyways, the point is be very careful with this one because it will remove everything. And let me run this. Cool. And one more thing, of course, if you drop a table, you have to commit these changes as well. So you either turn on the auto commit function or use the commit statement again after the drop table. If I run this, commit executed successfully. So I dropped the table on the server as well, not just in SQL Workbench. And I will create this table again soon, but there is one last thing that I want to talk about. 
and that's the extra parameters you can add after the data type of the column. And these are optional and mostly technical things, but let me highlight the three most important extra parameters or the three parameters I use most often when I work on data science projects. The first one is not null. Not null. Not null. Not null. If you add this, you can't add null values to the given column. Well, in practice, this will mostly mean that in these three columns, we cannot leave fields empty. And that makes sense. So for every student, we have to add a test result, a grade, and a passed value. I mean, I'm not sure it will make sense in practice. For instance, if a student misses a test accidentally, but just for the sake of the ex example, let's leave it like this. And let's talk about the second extra parameter, which can be really important, which is unique. And if you add this, you can't add the same value to the column twice. And this is especially important when you store unique user IDs, for instance. And the third extra parameter is primary key, like this, primary key. Practically speaking, this is a combination of not null and unique but it also has some technical advantages and let's not get there yet maybe in another video an important thing is that you can have only one primary key column per table and as i have deleted the previously created test results table with drop table i can run this and recreate my test results table with these extra parameters let's run it and again the table test results has been created I will run commit as well. It's committed too. And so again, in this version of this table, the student ID is a unique value that cannot be null. So I defined it as primary key and the test result grade and past columns have to have values in them. So I define them as not null. Again, the extra parameters are optional, but if you use them when you create a new SQL table, you can spare a lot of headaches for yourself later. For instance, and this is just a quick example of the top of my head. So for instance, Unique won't let you accidentally copy the same data set into your data table twice. And we could go deeper, but we won't, not in this tutorial anyway, because I just wanted to show you the basics for now. And yes, this is the end of this video. This is how you can create tables in SQL. As I said, these were the basics that I think you have to know as a data scientist. For more advanced applications, you can check out the original PostgreSQL documentation, which I linked below. And remember, in another video that will be linked somewhere around this video too, I will also show you the three most common ways to load and import data to the SQL table we have just created. If you like this video, please leave a like or a comment. And if you want to learn more about SQL, you have quite a few options. As I said, there is an article version of this video on the Data36 blog, where you will find the whole code base of this video. I've also created a free SQL cheat sheet that you can download by subscribing to my newsletter at data36.com newsletter. And if you want to become absolutely confident with SQL, you can check out my seven day zero to intermediate level SQL online course as well, where you will find a lot of SQL tasks for practicing as well. Anyways, thanks for watching. I'm Tommy Master from data36.com. Until next time.